said, I first went to Borneo, hard to believe, but 28 years ago as a young student to this uh, rainforest here, Gunung Palung National Park in western Borneo, home of rhinoceros hornbills and an incredible diversity of, of wildlife, including the endangered Bornean orangutan. And uh, my wife, Cheryl Knott, uh, is a primatologist, so I have a special direct connection with uh, an orangutan researcher, so it's been really a, a long-term interest, but orangutans are at a critical stage, and I decided in the last couple of years to focus renewed attention on orangutan conservation photography, and what I really want to do is to showcase the lives of wild orangutans to try to get people to realize the importance of protecting orangutan habitat. So all these orangutans that are in captivity or in rehab centers, uh, you know, it's important to take care of them, but we really, what, what I really want to do is inspire people to protect orangutans in the wild, and it's very difficult getting to the the remote rainforests where wild populations of orangutans still remain. Um, so I'm going to start with a little, a little sort of fun behind the scenes video and show you some of the adventures involved in getting to these remote rainforests in Borneo and also in Sumatra that I've been traveling to to document the remaining wild orangutans. Some effort, but there's still some incredible 
uh, rainforest out there in these areas that uh, we want to protect. Um, this is my wife Cheryl Knott. She's uh, been working on orangutans in Borneo for over 20 years, and they're not easy to study, these really wild orangutans. They are largely solitary. I mean, moms have their juveniles with them, but they are traveling long distances every day through the forest and sleeping in different places, you know, making a nest every night in a in a different spot, wherever they happen to be. The males are pretty much solitary, except for when they you know, occasionally consort with a female. And so to, to follow them, to do research on them, you need to, follow, you need to kind of do a human radio collar. There's no way to radio collar an orangutan. So you need to, to kind of have these human radio collars. You have to follow them until they make a nest, uh, then you know, go back to the camp. Uh, it's very wet and lots of rivers to cross and things. So uh, Cheryl often comes back to camp looking like that after a day of following. You know, she doesn't do it alone. She's got a team of re research assistants and graduate students, and they're out there every day of the year uh, following orangutans and, and collecting data on uh, orangutans in Gunung Palo. Yeah, so I had the great opportunity to, to piggyback on these re this research program and document the orangutans of Gunung Palo. And, you know, this is our article way back in 1998, the first big orangutan feature that I did with National Geographic that Cheryl wrote mainly about her, her PhD research about orangutan, uh, you know, how their uh, interaction between the environment and their reproductive rates, how they reproduce so slowly. She's trying to understand why orangutans only have babies once every, on average, eight years, the slowest breeding mammal in the world. Uh, and so, these, you know, this research has great implications for conservation. But the other big thing about this long-term research is it gives us a chance to tell stories about individuals. You know, so we can have we can have great, uh, you know, imagery. We can have great data, but uh, I think what people really connect to individual stories of individuals, especially an animal like an orangutan, that's so closely related to us. So, for example, I've been able to tell the story of this baby orangutan that you see here. Uh, her name is Walima. So she was. Uh, this picture was actually taken in 1999, when she was just a few weeks old. Her mother was one of the orangutans that lived right in the core area of our study site, and so. As Walima grew up, uh, and I periodically went back to this research station uh, practically every summer, uh, documented Walima when she was three years old, and you know, here she is when she's 10, and here she was when, in uh, 2014 when she was 15 years old, now a mature young female orangutan, getting interested in, in, the, in the, the males and consorting with one of the big males in the area. And uh, of course, one of the great things about working on great apes, they're so closely related to us that uh, you, you know, you can catch a urine sample from an orangutan by uh, holding out a plastic bag on the end of a stick very carefully when they pee from up in the canopy, and you know, bring that back. And all the sort of human urine tests that you can do on here, human urine work on orangutans. So Cheryl's team was catching urine from Walima, and last August or, uh, or actually July got a positive pregnancy test kit. The over-the-counter you know tests uh, work just fine. If you if you've, ever seen, if you've ever seen those two pink lines on one of these tests, very exciting. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was a great, uh, with great excitement that I went back to Borneo again this past April of this year to uh, try to uh, catch some images of Walima with her new baby and uh, look forward to documenting the, you know, the process of motherhood for this new orangutan. Of course, the advantage of Walima uh, is that she's been followed by researchers since she was an infant one of the best habituated wild orangutans anywhere, and so I was able to get really close to her. She completely ignores me, and I was, you know, when she's feeding quite low, I was able to get really intimate shots of a real wild orangutan with her infant uh, in, in the wild. Uh, it must be a little annoying when you're, you know, have a six-week-old baby orangutan who still never leaves her mom's body, still like her mom is her whole world, but she's got these incredibly climbing little hands and feet and can kind of climb all over you. Uh, and it uh, must be a little bit annoying being a orangutan mom sometimes. <clears throat> but uh, I want to tell you about what's been happening with orangutans as their habitat shrinks. So orangutans are only found in Sumatra and Borneo. It's two big islands in Southeast Asia, which are mostly Indonesia. Part of Borneo is also in Malaysia. These uh, have now been split into two different species. So the, uh, when I first did that article 20 year, you know, 15 years ago, orangutans were still classified as one species, but now Sumatran orangutans have become, been realized as being genetically very distinct. They're only uh, found in that limited area up in North Sumatra. There's only about 6,600 left in the wild. Borneo orangutans are spread a bit more widely across Borneo. 
uh, and there are about 45,000 left. So they're, they're also severely endangered. And one thing that I've been doing as part of my new effort to document orangutans in the last couple of years is to document the diversity of orangutan populations. Not only this sort of fairly subtle differences between Sumatra and Borneo that you can get a little sense of here, but I've been traveling to, uh, trying, to, trying to travel to all the major research stations and study sites for orangutans across Borneo and Sumatra, and there are about eight of them. I've been to six of them so far. And one really interesting thing that researchers have been finding who have been comparing notes from these different sites, uh, the one where Cheryl, where my wife works, is this one here, Gunung Palem. But she and her colleagues who work at these other stations have been comparing notes, writing scientific papers about cultural variation in orangutans. It's very fascinating. It's something that we're just beginning to appreciate, that you know, orangutans learn a lot from their mothers, from other orangutans, a lot of what we call social learning. And so one example would be making an umbrella when it rains. Uh, I don't know if uh, you knew this, but all orangutans make umbrellas when it rains. And I don't know if this guy learned it very well. He didn't make a very good umbrella. <laughs> Uh, but uh, as part of our research, we have our uh, Indonesian field teams, our research assistants and students. This is Yu Susanto, one of my wife's master's students. We've equipped everybody with handy cams so that when they're out there, uh, you know, I'm only there for maybe a month or two of the year. When my uh, Indonesian associates are out there following rock hunts every day, they have a chance to catch these rare behaviors. And uh, here you see a big male orangutan in a heavy rain uh, with a large umbrella on his head. Now the rain's letting up a little bit. And then he says, like, all the reasons. And I put the other one in the And then, yeah, I have some other indications here, but... Now it's stopping, and... I'd rather have you repeat. You can see that. All right, actually, that one actually worked pretty well. He actually stayed pretty dry. Another cool thing that varies is vocalizations vary between sites. This orangutan is making a big kind of kiss sound called a kiss squeak. It's a big kissing sound. It's a threat that orangutans use to other orangutans and also to people. But at some sites, they use leaves as part of this vocalization. They use a handful of leaves like this juvenile is practicing here. They kiss onto the leaves. Uh, before, but at other sites, they don't do that at all. So it's kind of like a, it doesn't really have any function. It's kind of like bowing versus shaking hands. It's a local cultural variation. A lot of variation in feeding techniques. Here, uh, this male is eating termites, and orangutans eat termites everywhere, but there are a lot of different techniques that they use to eat termites in different places. And uh, another fascinating one is nest building. Orangutans all build nests every night, but there are different variations. In some places, they sort of add pillows to the nest. Uh, you see this guy finishing up a nest here. Some places they add, you know, little blankets, if it, uh, or they make a roof on top if it's raining. Uh, he's doing something here with a, he just reached out and grabbed that big leaf plant that was ne nearby. Uh, and at this site, they often take that particular plant to their nest. And so researchers got, got curious about it. Um, I, I slowed down the video here so you can see what he's doing with it. Look, he's brushing these leaves against his head. Okay, which he really doesn't have any reason to do that uh, before he, he lies down. So what could he be doing? So here he is. I, I use a pole camera to get up above and look down into the nest after he went to sleep. And he has those leaves right underneath his head. Researchers tested this plant and found that it has mosquito repellent properties. So it seems like orangutans at this site, which is the most mosquito infested place I've been in Borneo, uh, they may have discovered this uh, mosquito repellent. So. Uh, those are the kind of things that we're just starting to learn about orangutans as people study them and, and observe their behaviors in more depth uh, because all these behaviors are seen rarely, you know, but in the meantime, their habitat is getting destroyed, right? So slash and burn agriculture, clearing for, for uh, oil palm plantations and so on. And what orangutans need more than anything is pristine rainforest. And so we'll, um, with my, with my wife Cheryl uh, and sh her small foundation in, in Borneo, the Gunung Palang Orangutan Conservation Program, which is an Indonesian NGO and also has an American arm. You know, of course, they've been using my imagery for years in, in promoting their work and in helping to fundraise and so on. Their website is savegporangutans.org if you want to learn more about it. And their main focus is, is community education in all the schools around this national park. Uh, 
this is the national park that you can see there outlined in white. It's, you, can, you can see it's mostly still green. Uh, it's got some little encroachment and nibbling away at the edges, but uh, we are working closely with the National Park Department to try to help uh, you know, preserve this park and secure it for the future. Uh, but we have also a second, um, well, I also want to mention that for all these other sites I've been going to, like in Sumatra, uh, I work closely with other NGOs there, uh, and I also make my pictures available, avail available to them. Uh, and the way I generally work, because this has come up in the panels and things also, the way I generally work is that, uh, you know, if I am able to have an assignment from, let's say, National Geographic to go shoot a story, and I want help from a NGO, local NGO, in Sumatra to you know, help me get access to a site and get some guidance in the field and so on, then I'm happy to you know, offer images in exchange for, for their help. And so, uh, and, I'm, and usually National Geographic is fine with that. You know, after, uh, after the fact, I can provide imagery for them to use. And it's, and it's a great collaboration that way. The other uh, thing that we're really trying to work on around the Nepal is trying to secure the buffer zone. So try to, what's happening is around these parks, the even though the park is protected on paper, the buffer zone is not, in, and everywhere around these parks is getting converted into more and more oil palm. Uh, this is an area further away from the park, but just to give you a sense of what the landscape in Borneo is sort of turning into, uh, vast, vast acres, you know, hectares of what used to be rainforest is getting converted into this huge monoculture. Right, so what happened to all the animals that used to live in this former rainforest? They all are either dead or they got forced out. Uh, <coughs> and a lot of the orangutans that lived in those areas are getting, you know, forced into contact with humans or getting captured or, or for the illegal pet trade or getting confiscated or somebody's calling up an authority because there's an orangutan in their garden. Uh, and, you know, eight baby orangutans in a wheelbarrow may... Uh, look very cute, but I want you to remember that or realize that each of these babies represents a dead mother, right? And also these animals that are in these rehabilitation centers with these organizations that are trying to care for these animals and hopefully raise them and then release them into the wild eventually, but still they've lost their culture. They've lost that knowledge of, of their particular forests and how to survive there, what to do uh, that they would learn from their mothers. So although taking care of these guys is also important, they're great apes, you know, what are we going to do? We have to look after them and try to give them the best life we can. But that's uh, the work that I'm really focused on is let's save the, them in the, in, let's save their habitat so that the remaining orangutans can survive in the wild and carry on their cultural traditions uh, and be around for the future. <coughs> Unfortunately, this year, as you've probably heard, it was a very uh, bad drought year in Indonesia. And uh, so I made one of the most depressing trips I've ever made to Indonesia last just a few weeks ago in October uh, to document some of these fires that were going on. Uh, this is a lot of the fires were in farmland where people burn their fields every year. This one was a little out of control. Uh, as I went toward the town of Palankaraya, which was in southern southern Borneo, near a lot of burning peat swamp forest, this is what the air looked like. We traveled up a river to go visit one of the important Orangutan research centers. Uh, as we got to the small village and unloaded our boat, the smoke in the air, you know, at sunset turned into this incredible, you know, orange glow that seemed like an apocalypse was going on. It was just bizarre. The Orangutan researchers at this site were, turn, had turned into firefighters. These, these uh, research assistants were putting, trying to put out these peat forest fires where the ground just gradually smolders away and the trees, roots are exposed and the trees fall over. And I photographed Rontons that were forced out to the edge of the river by uh, all the burning forest behind where the only strip of living trees was right along the river and these, you know, mom and juvenile are coming out and sort of saying, what happened to our forest? So, um, you know, this is something that uh, is the other big part of my campaign. Besides working on trying to secure protected areas like Gunapalong that in theory are already protected and just need, and need the kind of constant management and awareness to protect, uh, I also want to be able to use the imagery of orangutans in the wild and also these conservation issue images to inspire people, and especially in Indonesia, around the world, but especially in Indonesia where you know, government policy and public opinion are so important to make things better going forward. Um, so, you know, it was depressing photographing like a freshly burned 
forest that had already been planted with oil palm seedlings like a week after the fire, you know, which is technically illegal, but obviously blatantly being carried out uh, for anybody to see. Um, but I felt a little hopeful when I posted some pictures on the Nat Geo Instagram feed of like this one, the Rontons in the Smoke. Uh, I had hundreds of thousands of likes. And you know, looking at the comments, I had, there's, like you see in this one, 3,700 comments. Uh, and I, I'd say over half of them were from Indonesians. And many Indonesian young people were responding. Indonesians are becoming incredibly you know, social media aware. They're, they're, they all have smartphones. And they're, they're, you know, they're sending all kinds of comments, saying like, you know, thanks for inspiring us. Hope the Indonesian generation, next, you know, the young Indonesian generation will care more about the forest. Or they're tagging their president, Hazan Jokowi, or they're actually, they're, uh, and making lots of comments, thanking me for covering it, sort of saying stop using palm oil, and so on. So um, I felt like, you know, there is a chance to communicate with this next generation using these new media, uh, and I feel like. Uh, with photography and the communication outreach that we can, we can impact that we can have, uh, there are some rays of hope for the future. And so I hope to spread the word and uh, convince people that orangutans are worth saving in the wild. Thank you very much.